Thank you, a beautiful choir. Church, praise the Lord. Amen. And good morning. good morning. Praise the Lord. Amen. It's good to see you again this Sunday morning. And I bless the Lord for all of you and for your being present here with us. We are living at a very shaky time, so seasons, and things are changing very fast. Circumstances can change any moment. And the Gen Zs have taught us that V2, V change aga. Things can change. Kuna generation ya Gen Z kwa hii bada. Ebu sima meni tu wapongeze. Asante. Ye, wako hapa. Wanaogopa kusimama jameni, ye? Yes. Yes. We appreciate you so much. Asante. You know, it is good to have a generation that believes that things can be changed. Wale wazamani kama mimi, tulizoya kukaliwa. Lakini kizazi kipia, hawakalikiki. Ama waswaidi wanasema aje, hawa? <laughs> eh, how Sijui namna gani. So we appreciate all these members of the Generation Z for standing up for the nation. It is, it is such a transformative moment. You have caused our leaders to come back to their senses. I am humbled when I see them going to the constituencies and asking for forgiveness. It's, it's very humbling, is it? Yes, and God is dealing with their pride and arrogance, is it? And they are reminded that they are the servants of the people, not the masters. And so we pray that as God guides our nation, that the nation will be stable. We also pray against those who are taking advantage of the peaceful demonstrations to start destroying other people's properties and to start causing mayhem and commotions. We pray that for the peace and stability of this country, is it? I thank God for the grace of salvation. I'm born again. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, we again are on the fifth Sunday of the month of June, which is the last Sunday. And this month, we've been talking about Thanksgiving from the first Sunday to this last Sunday. And today, our sub-theme is Thanksgiving in adversity. You know, the Spirit of God leads his servants. Church, we met as the pastoral team of this cathedral in the month of March, early March, and we took a retreat away from the city to come up with our preaching program to prepare the sub-themes, the topics and the sub-themes for every Sunday, to craft even the readings that will be read every Sunday. And when I look at how things have been unfolding, I see how the Spirit of God led us way back early in the year. We did not know that times of adversity would come and we would experience what we are experiencing. I want to thank God for he still speaks even in our generation. Praise the name of the Lord. As we think about thanksgiving in adversity, Adversity means a time of difficulties. In Kiswahiri ni shida. And our nation has been going through various adversities. If you go online and Google the context of Kenya today, what are the main issues that are troubling the nation? You will see different articles talking about the high levels of unemployment among our young generation. You will see articles talking about 
the rising levels of poverty in our citizenry. You will also see difficulties uh, like the, the widening gap between the rich and the poor. And they are saying that this gap is a threat to the nation. You will see others like the various you know, diseases and uh, calamities that are facing us as a nation. You will see even the cost of living that is escalating by the day. I don't know what would have happened if the Finance Bill 2024 was passed and signed into law. The cost of living would have even gone further high. And so we are faced with a season of adversity, trouble, uncertain uncertainties. Young people who graduated back in 2010, even earlier, and they have never gotten an opportunity to be employed. The other day in our news, we were shown one of them who was the first in the family and in the area in the Maasai lad to attain a university degree. But after graduation, he's now working in the quarry mines, cutting stones, because he couldn't get a job. And these are, just, these are the things that are bringing desperation in our nation, frustrations, and people are becoming bitter by the day. But even as we list all these problems that are sociological, economical, we also need to look at them from a spiritual perspective as believers. And I want to say that nothing turns our hearts bitter. And nothing turns people to be selfish to be dissatisfied with life like the way ungrateful hearts do. When people develop ungrateful hearts, they quickly de degenerate into bitterness, into selfishness, into dissatisfaction with anything and everything. And this can be very dangerous when we are filled with bitterness, with selfishness. When we are dissatisfied, people can do anything. And that is what was forcing and, you know, pushing our young people. That even in the face of life bullets and death, they were willing to forge ahead. And this morning, I also want to confirm to us that a true spirit of thankfulness, and I want to repeat that again, a true spirit of thankfulness will reverse, you know, the bitterness, will reverse the dissatisfaction, will reverse even the selfishness that we have seen with our leadership class. It is the will of God that we live a life that is filled with joy. And the word of God teaches us that thanksgiving is an avenue, is the password that opens our lives to the joy of the Lord. And that joy of the Lord becomes our strength. In my preparation, I encountered a quote from a servant of God by the name Elizabeth Elliot. And she was writing from a context of difficulties, adversity. She was encouraging the church, and this is what she wrote. That God, so, sorry, let me read that again. God has promised 
to supply all our needs. What we don't have now, we don't need it now. This was the conviction in Elizabeth Elliot. And she was telling the church that it is true, God has promised to supply all our needs. This is true. But we also need to learn that what we have not received from him, from God, we may not necessarily be in need of it right now. Sometimes God takes time to prepare us, to prepare our character to be able to handle even the blessings that are coming our way. In Psalm 66, which was read to us from verses 8, the writer of this psalm, and I want us to refer to it, I read just two verses, that is Psalm 66 and verses 8 and 9. Hear what this psalmist says in verses 8. He says, Praise our God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from sleeping. For you, God, tested us. I want you to hear that very well. He does not mean his words. He says, my testing was from God. He says, for you, God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into prison. Can you imagine God taking you to prison? But the psalmist is saying, you brought us into prison and laid burdens on our backs. Do you know there are times God will lay burdens on your backs? You're trying to tell him, remove this burden from me. But instead, he is adding more burdens on your back. This is what the psalmist was going through. Here, he says, you let people ride over our heads. Can you imagine God letting people step on your head? And it is God allowing them to step on your heads. He says, we went through fire and water. This psalmist was not going through an easy time. It was a time of adversity. And maybe this resonates with someone in this service this morning. Going through a season that you can't believe that God is letting you go through it. Taking you to prison. Laying burdens on your backs. Letting people step over your heads. He says we went through fire and water. But I love God because he will always bring the word but. After you have overcome and passed your test, what does he do next? The psalmist says, but you brought us to a place of abundance. Praise the name of the Lord. So the challenges that the psalmist was going through was a testing that was meant to prepare him to be ready to handle the forthcoming abundance. Praise the name of the Lord. Kuna mambo tunamuomba mungu atujalie, lakini anaya withhold. Anatuacha tupitia mambo mazito. I read these verses and they reminded of my season when I finished my form four. It was not an easy season in our family. My dad was a simple driver at the University of Nairobi and he retired. My last born sister was in form three. She hadn't finished her high school. I had just finished my form four. And you know, drivers don't have pension. Drivers are not even given a lot of money when they retire. Maybe things have changed now. But back then, 
My dad, the gift he was given by Nairobi University was a wall clock. After serving the university for many years, can you imagine a wall clock? It is still hanging in his sitting room. I see it every time I go to visit him. Praise the name of the Lord. And so my dad asked me, my son, the savings I had, do I take you to college or do I educate your younger sister? Thank God I was born again then. I said to him, Dad, educate my sister. God will make a way for me somehow. I don't know how, but God will make a way. And from that time, I had to look for my own ways of growing myself. I had so much desired to go to, the, to a college or to the university, but I couldn't. And I struggled for a period of nine good years. You are born again. You love the Lord. You are serving him. But you are so broke. You're depending from one Kibarua to the other. Tried business in Gikomba when it was just rising up. El Nino came and one morning it swept the store where we were keeping our stock. Everything was carried by the waters. And I was asking God, are you still with me? Are you serious about this journey? Do you have to allow me go through this? And from a businessman, I went back to being employed. And what was the employment? Kupiga sad paper kwa furniture workshop. Yani unapiga sad paper, mikono inakuwa miepesi. Ukiguza kitu moto, unakiachiria tu. And I would tamak, you know, walking from Kayore to where the Point Mall is in Buruburu. That is where the Juakari sheds were. And for years I did that. Yet praising God and believing that one day he will come through. Praise the name of the Lord. You let us go into prison. You laid burdens on our shoulders. After my younger sister finished high school and my dad's money was over, she came to Nairobi to his brother. And the one who is struggling at Hamsa, kupiga sad paper na unalipu wa shirigisitini, I have to house her in Nairobi, I have to feed her, I have to pay for her fare when she's going to Kenya Polytechnic for her studies. Na mimi si somi. And I was asking God, you're laying more burdens on my shoulders? I did not know that God was preparing me for the abundance that will come ahead. You can imagine people whom we were with in high school, people whom I would defeat when we did exams. They would come laughing at me at Hamza and asking me to make stools and coffee tables for their houses while they are driving. I, I always remember that one of them came driving a Mercedes-Benz. And he would laugh at me and tell me, Sometimes God will allow you to go through prison. God will test you. Generation Z, yes, you have brought a revolution in this nation. But allow God to work on you and prepare you for the abundance that he's laying ahead of you. Praise the name of the Lord. Do not be discouraged. You could be here and you're going through fire and waters. This was the situation with Habakkuk. We read from Habakkuk chapter 3 verses 16. And in verse 16 he says, I heard and my heart you know, pounded, my lips quivered at the sound, decay crept into my bones, and my legs, you know, trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come 
on the nation invading us. What was Habakkuk going through? Who is Habakkuk? Very little is known about this prophet of God by the name Habakkuk. Very little indeed. We are not even told about his parents. We are not even told about the city he came from. This man, we are not even told where he was born or what he was doing. We are not told about his career. We can only try to assume. Like, for example, at the end of chapter 3, there is a notation that is written there. And it is, rare, it is written for the director of music on my stringed instruments. Can you see that notation in your Bible? So that notation tells us that probably Habakkuk was one of the singers in the temple or in the house of God. Maybe he was one of the Levites who were in the singing ministry, what we call today the choir. He was a prophet in the choir. Very little is known about him. However, his name comes from a Hebrew root that means embrace, kukubatia. So he na his name means to embrace, kukubatia. There is a rabbinical tradition. Now, what is a rabbinical tradition? This is, these are sayings from the rabbis of Israel back then. And this rab rabbinical tradition suggests that Habakkuk was the boy whom Elisha the prophet raised back to life in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 32 to 36. So some rabbis in Israel believed that Habakkuk was the boy of the Shunammite woman. You remember the story of the Shunammite woman? who died and the mother, you know, picked up his servant and picked up a donkey and they ran towards the direction where Elisha was. And Elisha performed a miracle by lying on the boy. The Bible says, if you read 2 Kings 4.32, he, he, he laid his body upon him head to head, eyes to eyes, nose to nose, mouth to mouth, hands to hands, three times. And the body of the boy grew warmer from death. And by the that time, he sneezed and woke up from his death. Praise the name of the Lord. It sounds a very good story. But it was told by the rabbis. It is not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. We do not have evidence to support that tradition. So it means he may be the boy, he may not be the boy. We are not sure. I'm waiting for the day we go to heaven. Ask your neighbor, will you be in heaven? Yes, we shall ask Habakkuk when we get there. Why are you the boy? Amen. Na wapa story za kupiga uko biguni, eh? Yani unaenda ukiuliza, nani Habakkuk? Prophet Habakkuk ako wapi? Habakkuk. Why are you the boy? Praise the name of the Lord. Why are you? Yes. We shall ask him that question. But this Habakkuk, he lived in the final decades of Judah, the nation of Judah. Why are we saying the final decades? Because Judah was about to be judged by God because of the high levels of injustices in their nation. There was also high levels of adultery, the worship of idols. There were also the rising threat from the kingdom of Babylon that was growing to become the superpower in the world then. And Habakkuk as a servant of God was agonizing while he was witnessing evil people prospering in his nation. While he was witnessing people who are idol worshippers, you know, prospering in his nation. And in his prayers, he was asking God, can't you intervene in this situation? Why must the wicked people prosper? And that is the question Kenya is asking today. Why are the corrupt the ones that are prospering in this nation? 
This is the question that Generation Z is asking that themselves. Even Prophet Habakkuk asked himself the same question. And in his prophecy, Habakkuk was true to his name, embrace, remember? He was true to his name. When he was asking himself these questions and asking God the same questions, he embraced a strong faith in God. He did not doubt God because evil is prospering in the nation. We have seen believers backsliding and starting to do the things the world is doing so that they can prosper. We have seen believers, you know, despising their faith in God and running to witch doctors and to sorcerers. Iri wapewe dawa za kuwafanikisha. Because they think it is only the wicked that are prospering in the nation. Habakkuk embraced a strong faith in God. That he was ready to go through hell. He was ready to go through waters and the fires. He will wait patiently for the day of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. I pray that we can have a faith like that of Habakkuk. A faith that is not moved by what is happening. A faith that is not moved when the wicked prosper. A faith that knows that sure God will come to bring his judgment. Praise the name of the Lord. And so Habakkuk is a very unusual prophet. Because the whole of his book, he does not address the people of Judah. The whole of his book is contain or, or consists of his direct dialogue with God. Habakkuk was a prophet of prayer. He asked God the hardest of his questions. And he would wait until God answers each of those questions. If you read from chapter 1, he raises like three different questions. And God responded to him. He deals in his questions, he deals with one of the greatest mysteries that, you know, continues to trouble us even today. The apparent triumph of evil in a world created by a good, loving, and sovereign God. Even today we struggle with that. How can evil seem to be prospering in a world that is created by a good God? In a world that is created by a loving God? In a world that is created by the sovereign God? And so he was asking God prayerfully, but asking courageously very strong questions. These questions did not lead. Many people, when they ask themselves the same questions today, they tend to say there is no God. They tend to say, no, God cannot be there. If evil is prospering, then he is not good. But for Habakkuk, as he made these questions and courageous prayers, yet he remained with an unshakable faith in the, and hope in God. His faith was unshakable. His hope in Yahweh was unshakable. I was reading this and I was saying, we need such a courageous servant of God desperately in our nation today. Servants of God that can ask bold questions to God and even to the authorities of the day. Thank you, Gen Z's, for asking bold questions to the government. We need such servants. In our families, people who will not keep quiet when our families are crumbling down. People who will not keep quiet when evil is prospering, but they will stand to speak and to say this is wrong. But as they do so, they hold a strong and shakeable faith in God Almighty. In chapter 3, verses 17 following, Habakkuk is given answers by God in chapter 2, and in chapter 3, he turns to God in prayer. 
And after God had explained to him that he is the judge of all and he is coming to judge Judah and afterwards he will judge Babylon, the superpower of the world, then Habakkuk believed the word of God and he turns to God in prayer. And in verses 17 to 19, he prays faced with the reality of the judgment of God. He knew that Babylon has been lifted up by God, a wicked kingdom, a kingdom that is without mercy, that will tear down the nation of Judah. Habakkuk prayed, yet not in desperation, but a prayer of praising God in the midst of destruction in the midst of devastation. He knew they were faced with soon crop failure. Animals would be taken away from them. He knew that they would not be able to produce their food again. He knew that their future would be crushed down by the Babylonians. But he says, even though these things happen, because they are coming from God's judgment, yet I will praise the Lord my God. Praise the name of the Lord. He does not allow the, his feelings to be controlled by the events around him. He allows his life to be controlled by the faith he had in God's ability to strengthen him. My brothers and my sisters, in our nation today, I encourage you, do not allow the events that are taking place in this nation to control your life. But let your unshakable faith in God, your belief in God's ability to strengthen you, let this control your life. Let this lead you to God, to God, the way Habakkuk did. In prayer, praising God in the midst of calamity. Praising God because he is the only one who is able to lift us up from the pit. He is the only one that is able to get us out of the prison. He did it for Joseph in Egypt. And he removed him from the prison even to the palace. He is the same God. He is the same one that led the psalmist in Psalm 66 through waters and through fire, but finally to a place of abundance. He is the same God. He does not change. When Daniel, in Daniel chapter 6 and verses 10, when his enemies, you know, made up a plan, you know, they conspired to kill and destroy Daniel forever. And they set up a plan with the king that anybody who does not worship you and pray you, they shall be put into the lion's den. What did Daniel do? Daniel did not go into a cell of pity. Daniel did not start saying, God, you have abandoned me. No, in the midst of adversity, the Bible says in Daniel chapter 6 and verses 10, that he got down on his knees and prayed giving thanks to his God just as he has done even before. Praise the name of the Lord. I invite you, in the midst of the difficulties we are going through, the adversities that we are faced with as a nation, as families, as individuals, be wise like David and like Daniel. Turn to God in prayer, in humility, in thanksgiving, Tell him you are bigger than all my difficulties. Turn to him in prayer like Habakkuk. Tell him, even though I go through prison, even though you make me carry more burdens, I will come to you in praises and thanksgiving. Praise the name of the Lord. Even though I lack what I need today, I will offer to you my thanksgiving sacrifices. Do not allow the circumstances you are in today control your life. Thanksgiving is the key that helps you to access the abundance that God is setting for us ahead. Pass your test. If you're going through adversity, 
pass your test. Thanksgiving, we do it with a lot of expectation. We know that when we give it to God, we give him an opportunity to glorify himself through our circumstances and also to make all things work together for our good now and in the days to come. As we offer God our thanksgiving in the midst of our troubles, in the midst of our pains, in the midst of our sicknesses, maybe you are here and you're going through a sickness. Look up to God. Like Daniel, offer him thanks by your words. Offer him thanks by your sacrifices. Tell him you are bigger than all my troubles. My today, my tomorrow is in your hands. And I know that my tomorrow will be better than my today. May God bless us. May God strengthen us. May God make us bold in our prayers. Bold in our thanksgivings. Bold in our sacrifices. As we remain firm in our faith like the servant of God, Habakkuk. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.